Hi, this is Micah Hill, Superintendent of Schools, and today I am sitting with Tamalee Robinson, the Director of the Flathead County Health Department. Tamalee, thanks for visiting with me today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Tamalee and I have spent a considerable amount of time on uh, Zoom and uh, in meetings, and uh, she's been a wonderful resource for our district in helping us with our plans and uh, reopening and, and, and doing things in a safe way. And wanted to talk to Tamalee a little bit today just about some of the things that are going on within our district and, and how the county health department helps support what we're doing and uh, hopefully give a little bit of guidance uh, for parents and students and staff. And so Tamalee, I'm going to start with kind of a, a hot topic um, and that is sports uh, activities okay. in general. And, um, you know, we've seen across the nation uh, in, in professional arenas and at the college level, schools are, are you know, they're canceling their activities or they're doing a very minimal, uh, not allowing fans, things like that. And I know our activities directors, uh, especially at the high school level, Mark uh, Dennehy and Bryce Wilson have been working with you as well as with the uh, other activity directors across the valley um, on putting together a plan that would support and allow our students to continue to participate. So what can you tell us about those plans? Okay, I can kind of tell you how those, ca those plans came apart about the Montana High School Association pushed it down to the local level and the health officer to help the counties uh, develop their grant their guidelines for sports uh, initially the five biggest counties came together the health officers with um, the Montana High School Association because we wanted one uniform guideline for all the biggest counties because we knew teams would be playing across lines to make it simple. Um, during that meeting, um, the governor's 50 rule of if you can't have more, you can't have more than 50 people in a, an event if they can't social distance. That was interpreted a little bit different by different counties. One county wanted no sports at all. Two counties wanted to let no more than 50 people on the field. That would have been 18 players per team and then the coaches and the referees. So we came to a conclusion, we couldn't come to a conclusion. So at that point in time, um, the governor was brought into the discussion. So the governor um, met with us all and said that when he allowed schools to go back into session, that knowing schools couldn't have, would have more than 50 people that couldn't be socially distanced, it effectively gave them a pass for that, for schools and school activities. So we moved forward at that time. Um, I thought it was really important to let the parents watch the kids play. I didn't think it was fair that we, you know, would have that ability and not to do that. There were other counties who wanted no spectators at all. So we, um, I met with the athletic directors. We put the plan together, decided that there would be uh, two tickets uh, per player, um, their choice for spectators. Um, no concessions, and then followed the Montana High School Association guidelines with that. Um, since then, um, Butte has followed suit. Um, um, let me see. Butte followed suit. Great Falls followed suit. Um, Gallatin just came out and they're going to have the same. Uh, Yellowstone is going to have no spectators. Um, yeah, Helena is going to have no spectators. And Missoula, I believe, is going to stick with the 50 people on the, the field rule. I'm not, I'm not sure on that. They haven't officially announced anything. So that's how we came at the two spectators per player. Well, and I, I think as our, you know, obviously we'd want to have as many spectators as we can and, uh, and recognize the importance of activities in the educational process and that it's not just about a sport, it's about a lot of other things and, sure. and character development and skill building and those kind of things. And, and I guess just on behalf of uh, our, our students and activities, um, we're grateful that we have the opportunity, one, to even be able to participate, and two, that we're allowed to at least have uh, parents uh, or at least two spectators per uh, suited up athlete. So we're grateful for that and really appreciate your work with, with our district and in our county 
on behalf of our community. So very appreciative of that. Uh, and these rules, I mean, we will revisit them periodically. And if, you know, the reasoning for the guidelines are there's a lot of angst about starting school and will schools be able to remain open and not have outbreaks in them. And we realize that we don't know what it's gonna look like. So if we start out with stricter regulations, I mean, we can always loosen them up. If we go along and we're not having outbreaks in the schools or on the sports teams, you know, our goal ultimately is to keep schools open and keep the sports teams so they can continue to play competition. Yeah, and that's great. And so we appreciate that. And I think part of the takeaway on that is, you know, obviously we have uh, in our activities, we also include our band and, and those kind of things. And so our goal would be to, if we can do the things that we need to do as a school community to keep ourselves safe, reduce transmission, uh, to be able to allow more and more uh, participation from, from our, a variety of our activities. So we're grateful for that. And Tim Lee, uh, next topic, uh, we have been having conversations around, you know, how do we move from one phase to another? Um, and, I, and I think you hit the nail on the head that there's, there's concern that we're going to open schools and that there potentially could be an outbreak and that we may have to look at closing schools or quarantines or, or things like that. And um, Tamley is part of our uh, COVID advisory council, which also includes uh, other people from your office uh, that are experts. Uh, we have an epidemiologist, uh, representatives from the hospital, uh, doctors and nurses, they're helping us with that. And what, what can you tell us about the work that's, that's gonna be done around that? Well, um, we have community indicators um, for the community, and that would be what is our uh, capability to do the contact tracing as far as staffing? Um, what is, um, what are the levels of transmission? Um, are, are they going up? Are they plateauing? Are they going down? And then we also want to look at that. When we look at our numbers of cases, we want to look at what does that look like? Is it community spread or do we have an outbreak in one, one certain area where we have 25 in one thing like a long-term care facility. That would ar artificially spike our numbers and which really would have much to do with the school setting at all. Um, the other indicators we look at is what are, what are the tests available? Do we have the testing capacity and lab capacity to um, test those contacts in our, our positive cases? Do we have the ability to do that? That's another thing we look at. So we have a, a variety of community indicators, which, you know, I know we are going to set up with the schools, you're going to use different indicators. Um, and we haven't, have you set those yet? You know, we haven't. We, okay. We've identified a few. We looked at things like um, number of positive cases within a school, potentially uh, number of quarantines. And I think our, our biggest concern is that if we don't have the adult capacity uh, in our schools to continue to teach our students that it would it may uh, force us to go into a remote situation um, and that's what we're trying to avoid and so uh, we will be developing those metrics uh, we have a meeting uh, next Tuesday uh, where we're going to hopefully hammer those out and we'll be able to put those metrics on our website I know on your website uh, for the Flathead County Health Department you have those metrics in there and I think it's going to be a combination of looking at what is your ability uh, as a county health department and then what is our ability from a capacity standpoint. Um, and, and then another important piece community wise is the capability of the hospital. Do they have, you know, are they being overrun with cases or do they have the capability to take care of the ones who are indeed hospitalized? Yeah. And at this point in time, our hospital has not reached um, a surge capacity. Okay. And so speaking of the hospital, I got a call uh, last week, and, and I think you've been in contact with the hospital as well. Um, they're really looking to partner with all of the schools in the county, uh, as well as with the county health department, to be able to provide additional support uh, and resources for our schools in the way of uh, helping possibly with contact tracing, uh, maybe testing, um, and uh, in mental health services and additional nurse and, and physician support. Um, can you tell us anything more about that or? 
Sure. Well, uh, we met with the hospital this last week, and we're, we'll in, unveil that tonight. Um, the health department will be doing the contact tracing, but they will be helping us in regards to uh, the testing capabilities and capacity because we know that, you know, our guidelines are and what we like to do is anyone who's a contact, we like to initially test them. So the hospital has agreed to um, make that testing available right when we need it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That is good. So speaking of contacts, um, sometimes there's there's questions about, you know, if you were positive with COVID and you and I were in a room together mm -hmm. and, you know, and and someone else is in the room with us. Can you tell us a little bit about what a, can you define a close contact? Sure. I, do you want me to go through the whole process? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, I'll go through the whole process of contact tracing. So all of the confirmatory labs come to our office. So, so if we have a lab confirmed case in a school, what will happen is we will work with that school to turn it around as quickly as we can. Right now, the plan is that we will contact the school and that evening we will meet and um, the hospital will also come with us. We will meet with the administrator and the school nurse. We will identify the contact and anyone who has been within six feet and at least 15 minutes of that contact would be considered a contact. Now, um, we would call all of, all of those people those children and then begin the process. What happens with the, those contacts is we would test initially test them and then the contacts would be under quarantine for 14 days. That means they have to stay at home for 14 days. Even though they're, if they are asymptomatic and their test is negative at the beginning, they still have to finish that 14 day quarantine period. We contact them throughout that 14 days to make sure they're doing okay and they're not symptomatic. If they become symptomatic within those 14 days, we would get them in, test them again to see if they are indeed positive. If they are, then we would start that whole process with that positive case. The thing is, I, I really wanna um, emphasize is don't call the health department if you think you are a contact. We will be contacting you if you are a contact. So we will be going through those seating assignments with the school when we identify a case and we will determine who indeed is a close contact. We will also be interviewing the family of, of the child who is positive to identify those contacts as well to see if they were in any kind of sporting groups or play groups or if they went to childcare after school so we'll do a thorough investigation of that, but I don't want people to kind of be alarmed and and call saying I'm a contact. We will identify the contacts and we will get a hold of them. Okay, well that, that helps. I, I think, um, you know, as we talk about our reopening plans and, you know, take a large high school or a large middle school, and we're certainly doing things like one-way hallways and, and things like that, but you know, there can be passing periods where you know, three or four hundred kids are moving through the hallways, and uh, and and someone testing positive in a school doesn't necessarily make everybody that was in the hallway a close contact, because Correct. the the kind of the rule of thumb is, fifteen minutes or more in a confined space, uh, more than six feet or closer, closer than, six, than six feet, closer right. than six feet. So passing someone right. in the hallway with my mask on, I'm not going to be identified as a close contact. No. And no. so we don't want people calling in and saying, I'm a close contact when they haven't been identified. Yes. Okay. We will contact them. That makes sense. Uh, so, Tamley, one of the other uh, questions and, and probably the last one that I'll, I'll ask you today is uh, there is concern, uh, I've certainly heard it, uh, about, you know, people can be, have a lot of different symptoms and those symptoms can mirror COVID-like symptoms. Right. Uh, you know, for example, if I have allergies, I might sneeze or have a, a cough. Um, and so who, who would you recommend that, that a parent or a staff member call uh, to talk about maybe what their symptoms are and whether or not they should be identified for testing? Um, what, what's the recommendation there? 
Okay, so if a child was symptomatic and at school and sent home, the recommendation would be if that child, if they have a fever, say, it would be that they would stay home until they were fever free for at least 24 hours without a fever reducing medication and that their signs and symptoms had diminished. Um, if you're just in a situation where, you know, I'm having signs and symptoms um, or you went past that 24 hours, we would, we would expect you to um, contact a, a medical provider and be evaluated to see if you needed to be tested for COVID. I will say a lot of our positives are people who thought they had allergies. I mean, not everybody has a fever and not everybody has really severe symptoms, especially kiddos. So they attributed it to allergies, but really in reality, they had COVID. So if you have any of the signs and symptoms and they last, you know, a couple of days or so after 24 hours, um, contact a metal, medical provider uh, and, be, and consult with them and see if they indeed think you should be tested for COVID. Okay, that's good. And, uh, you know, I, we have been emphasizing uh, our three W's in terms of mitigation and, okay. and the things that we are hearing from certainly our, our county health department and through the CDC and other organizations and, and local pediatricians is to wash your hands. And washing your hands with soap and water, certainly the best hand sanitizer, uh, also very effective uh, in, in a mitigation strategy. Uh, we also emphasize watch your distance. Uh, if you can maintain six feet of distance, great, but we know that in all our schools, that's not gonna be a reality. Uh, to be able to do that, but we are encouraging people to spread out as much as possible. So five feet is better than four, four is better than than three. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last one is wear a mask. Um, you know, and I know that's been somewhat controversial. Uh, and what I have been telling people is that this is about protecting other people's health. Um, we don't know if uh, a staff member is caring for an elderly parent mm -hmm. uh, and that could be uh, health compromised. Um, and I don't know if, uh, you know, if someone has a sibling that, you know, potentially could be health compromised. So we want to keep emphasizing, though, are there any other uh, things that you would recommend to uh, parents at this point in terms of uh, mitigation strategies? I mean, I, I think those are the most important, and, and you're 100% correct. I mean, don't, don't wear a mask because the CDC tells you to, because the president tells you to, because the governor does the health officer or the superintendent. I mean, wear the mask to protect those who can't protect themselves. You know, they have underlying health conditions and you don't know if the person next to you is, has someone in their household with, you know, um, who is immune compromised. And also do it to protect the schools to stay open. That's the ultimate goal here is let's keep our schools open. Let's, let's keep our businesses open. You know, this can be contained by individuals willing to wear a mask and stop the spread of the virus. Great. Well, Tim Lee, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today and to uh, share some of your insights. Um, uh, certainly uh, in your position, it can be sometimes an impossible job and very grateful for you stepping up to uh, lead our county health department and, uh, and your leadership and, and what your staff is doing to provide support to our community. So very grateful and appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. You're welcome.